talk about. No, I've had a Twitter account for quite a while, but I've resisted actually sending out a tweet. So if you don't mind, I'd like to send out uh, my first live tweet from on stage. Is that okay? Okay, so first tweet other than replies from on stage at TEDx Salem. And I'm going to borrow a phrase from one of my good friends, Vanilla Ice. Word to your mother. <laughs> Bam. There we go. So we've come a long time since the days of mainframe computers. PCs first uh, came around uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I first started using PCs when I was a deputy sheriff. And I kind of had the knack of being able to work on them back in the days of the 286s and the 386s. And over time, I've observed that the power of computers has dramatically increased. Now, according to Moore's law, the number of transistors on a processor will double approximately every two years. That's pretty darn cool. That's exponential increases in speed and performance. However, there's a mind bender here. As the performance of the processors have increased, the size, the physical size has decreased, and so has the thermal or temperature output. So what does this mean? Uh, according to Michio Keku's new book, Physics of the Future, the power of the smartphone that you have in your pocket right now is more powerful than all the NASA computers in 1969 when we sent two astronauts to the moon. Let that sink in. That phone you have in your pocket is actually a supercomputer. And it's involved in our everyday lives. So let's think about this. Let's say that you'd like to take your significant other out to dinner. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to bring up your, uh, your Yelp. You're going to search for a restaurant in Salem. And of course, Venti's is going to be the one that you'll choose, right? <laughs> So you'll text your significant other, tell, you, uh, tell them to meet you down there. We'll sit and we'll order a wonderful meal. It comes out, and of course, Ventes does a beautiful presentation, so you have to take pictures of it, right? Okay, we all do that. Post on Instagram, Facebook. Enjoy your meal. Have some of their fine beers on tap, of course. And so you finish your meal, and you want to rate it, so you'll pop on one of the different apps that you can rate your meal. And you realize, well, you've had a few too many adult beverages, so you'll bring up your Lyft app, if it was allowed in Salem, and you'll get a ride home. So phones, re smartphones really allow us to do a lot of different things in our lives. Almost anything you can do on your computer, you can do on your smartphone. But there's a couple exceptions. And these exceptions have to do with applications that are graphic intensive. And these fall in two major categories. One would be video games. Do we have any video gamers out here? OK. And also, uh, people who use high-end applications, like maybe uh, someone who does uh, graphics processing. Maybe uh, you work on movies like Avatar 2, or you do 3D modeling and design. So, wouldn't it be awesome if these two groups, huge groups of users, could also be free and not be tethered to their workstation or their home PC? Well, uh, my friends at NVIDIA have a new technology called NVIDIA Grid. And what this means is that they have graphics-intensive uh, servers that allow you to have a virtualized or remote environment wherever you are so you can operate these high-end applications and you're no longer uh, chained to your desktop. So let's look at one example. Let's say that... Uh, I'd like to play one of my favorite games, Borderlands 2, and that's a high-end first-person shooter game. Tons of fun, but if I want to play it, you know, I have to play it on my desktop. But I can use the device that I showed you when I first came out here, the NVIDIA Shield, which is a handheld gaming unit, and I can remotely stream from the NVIDIA uh, Grid Cloud that game to my mobile device, and I can take that game with me maybe when I have to pick my son up from school, so I'm no longer tethered to my PC. So what about those of us who work? Like I mentioned, people who do high-end graphics uh, editing and such. Well, NVIDIA Grid also works for those high-end applications. Uh, you uh, One good, good, really cool uh, application of this is in the education environment. So NVIDIA teamed up with Autodesk, who make a lot of the high-end applications that I described. And they worked with the St. Lawrence Academy to come up with a really a low-cost turnkey solution whereby those uh, 300 students could 
leverage the highest level of technology and do the cutting edge applications to uh, really improve their learning environment. So Autodesk supplied the applications for free, NVIDIA streamed the information into the school so the school could use their lower end PCs and even tablets to be able to do this high end gaming. What happened? Student engagement drastically increased. Uh, they were able to gain skills they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And when they go out to find a job, they can hit the ground running because they have relevant experience. So this has actually in really improved our lives. And I think that this will help to also bridge the digital divide in other areas, hopefully other countries as well. So now that we have these supercomputers in our pocket, the next step is to extend them out. And you've heard of wearables. Perhaps Google Glass that gives you a second, uh, second screen for your, your phone. Nice product. There'll be newer ones coming out. Hopefully, they'll have an indicator light so you'll know if the camera's on because we don't want to be recorded when we don't agree with it. And also, that way, you won't get banned from establishments. But one of my uh, really fa uh, favorite, favorite wearables is the smartwatch. Did anybody here uh, watch this last week the Apple announcements for the iPhone 6 and the iWatch? <laughs> to be, I have to admit something. I'm kind of a troll. I like to play tricks on people. For the last two years, I've worn uh, this iPod Nano on my wrist, and I've been trolling people, telling them it's a prototype iWatch. <laughs> so this has been a really good time for me. Now, if you are not, uh, an Apple user, there are currently a plethora of smartwatches available on the market now, uh, including the Moto 360. And these devices are wonderful. Not only are they a second screen, but they have sensors that you can use for fitness. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful device. Now, there are some really cool medical uh, uh, devices coming out as well that are wearables and implantables. One is a joint project between uh, Google and Novartis, the medical company. They've come out with a contact lens that monitors the, uh, your fluid, your tear fluid, for your uh, glucose levels. And so this is really good for diabetics because you have real-time monitoring, and it sends it back, of course, to your smartphone or your smart device. These contact lenses also have the capability of autofocusing dynamically in real time. So no longer will you have to have a static correction in your contact lenses but they will adjust to whatever you're looking at and whatever your particular needs are at that time. Ah, now this is a very interesting, interesting, embeddable, not exactly a wearable. Uh, there's a, uh, this device was funded by Bill Gates uh, to release small levels of medication into your system. It was used to treat an osteoporosis patient in 2012 and is currently being adapted uh, to use for birth control, to release on a controlled basis the right uh, medication that you need at the right time. And you can see this will probably extend out into many other uses. Ah, Battle of the Bulge. Anyone here fighting it besides me? So there are some fitness devices, like uh, uh, I think Fit Tracker, uh, that will measure your uh, fitness activity and report back and maybe give you some positive and negative reinforcement. Well, the Battle of the Bulge really takes place at the kitchen table, not in the gym. So this device, Bite Tracker, will actually measure the amount of bites that you take in the day and will help you maintain your diet. There are some other devices uh, that I haven't listed here uh, that will actually operate on the Pavlonian uh, response theory and will give you a sh uh, negative feedback by a shock if you engage in whatever activity you program it to. <laughs> Honey, don't do it, please. Not for Christmas. So what does this all mean? Like anything else, it's all a matter of perspective and you know, making informed decisions. You know, with some of the devices that, uh, may, that take in your fitness levels or maybe monitor your behavior, there's some security risk, of course, with hackers. Uh, you also need to be concerned about who can get access to that information, like insurance companies. You need to uh, read the... Uh, the licenses and the terms of usage. But for me, I look at it in a positive or a glass half full perspective. 
I see these devices being able to bring us back together as a, as a community. So let me give you one possible example. Let's say that uh, you're walking down the street with your Google Glass, and a person's walking by you, and their public profile allows you to see that they're in the gardening just like you are. You could main, can, main, or contact that person that you had no idea had the same interests as you, and you've made a, a, lo, a connection that would have been a lost opportunity otherwise. So, you know, it's a wonderful device or a wonderful set of devices. And I, like I said, I think that we could really bridge the digital divide by putting inexpensive devices into the power of more people and give them uh, access to the internet, because power is definitely knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.